Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great to be with you, and I'm really thankful for this special opportunity to share in the message time with my wife, Emily. And uh, we just really feel the Lord has put something on our hearts for you. And one of the things that struck us is that it's not two messages. We really felt the Lord speaking to us from his word and times together preparing one single message that we're going to share in together. And so that can be a challenging thing, but we really uh, felt the Lord help us with that. And so um, we're thankful to be able to bring this to you. We're in week five of our devoted series, and uh, we're going to finish off today on our culminating day during the 23 hours of prayer event in our series talking about loving like Jesus. We're going to talk about the love of God in our lives, moving us to love others the way that Jesus loved people. I'm going to start us off a little bit, and then Emily's going to pick up and share some things that the Lord has shared with her. Our first week, we had the power of prayer. Our second week was God's Word. These are foundational things to our relationship with the Lord and our devotion to Him. And if you miss these, if you miss any of these five weeks, I guess that would be four if you're here this morning, um, I would really encourage you to go back and catch those because they're really uh, not just initiatives for this five-week series, but they're really launching points for us, and maybe for you a relaunch into a life of devotion to Jesus. Power of prayer, God's word. Week three was sharing Jesus with others, and last week our lead pastor, Greg, spoke to us about self-denial. And I've been prayerfully digesting his message this week And just thinking about that and spending time each day just really digesting that. And so today we're going to talk in this last part of our series about the love of God in our hearts for others. Loving like Jesus loves. Loving like Jesus. I want to start out with this scripture passage. 1 John 4, 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now John was writing to believers in the early church, and it's important that we keep in mind that this is a message for believers. There are principles of love here that would apply to all, because love comes from God, John said, and God is love, but specifically within The body of Christ, believers, love is to be a defining mark of our lives that the love of God would be so in us that we would relate to one another in love. And this word love appears over and over again. We're going to pause on these first couple verses here for a moment before we move on. But this word love is like a dozen times in these verses 7 to 12. And you read the Bible and you find out that love is all through the Scripture. It's the primary theme of the Bible, the love of God. And the word love appears in different forms, but throughout the Bible you just read about love. And it's that big word that has such a big place in our lives and a big place in our culture and love. So what is love really? What is it? What, how do we know what love is? It's such a big deal in our lives. It's a big question. Is love a feeling? Is love a thing? Is love something you do? Is it this, just this power that just is and you suddenly have it in your life? What is love? That big question really has been a question that people have had all through the ages and has led to some of the best songs and movies, right, and stories, and all the different kinds of love. And I was thinking about this, what a big role love has in its various forms, and often my mind will go to music, and unfortunately, the song that came to mind was not the song that I wanted stuck in my head, and I just can't get it out of my head. And you might know this, and it really was. I I said, you know, I'm going to just think here, meditate prayerfully, and think about what is love. And, of course, I'm going to answer it with Scripture. 
Um, we're going to talk about that. But the, immediately this, and I don't know why, because I wasn't a big fan of this song. Maybe you know this song. It was a 1993 smash hit, what you could call one of those one-hit wonders. How many knows what a, how many, uh, who knows what a one-hit wonder is? By a guy named Hathaway, and it's called What is Love? And if you don't know what that is, I think a few people might know what that is. Maybe, maybe we should sing the first part of it. Okay, and then, <laughs> it's already stuck in my head, so maybe this will help. Okay, you ready? Now it's going to be stuck in everybody's head. <laughs> That's true. You're welcome. Are you ready? Just in case you're feeling left out and you're hearing all of this, you know, snickering and stuff and laughing. What is love? Baby, Baby don't, don't hurt, hurt me. me. Don't, don't hurt, hurt me. me. No more. Whoa. Whoa. I guess a lot of you know that song. And you can see why I didn't really want that one stuck. And I even went online and thought, well, I'll listen to it for a moment. And then I just can't. So if you have a good trick for getting songs out of your head, would you please see me after the service and um, help me clear my thoughts? So what can we know about love? There's so many parts to love. We're going to be talking about God's love this morning. I want to give you just a few ways we can answer love, um, answer the question, what is love? And we're going to really focus on God's love. Love is mysterious. How many of you know that it is true? Love is a mysterious thing in its many dimensions, and love is multi-dimensional. Love can be self-focused. It can be friendship. It can have to do with friendship love. It can be associated with family, familial love, and bloodline, and it can also be selfless. Love can be selfless, and that's the highest form of love. It's the highest kind of love. And then each of those different dimensions of love has their own set of dimensions. And in a few moments, Emily's going to be sharing with us about two very important dimensions of the highest kind of love. You know, in this verse uh, that we had on the screen there, we're going to look in a few moments at the remainder of those verses, 1 John 4, 7 to 12. But the word love comes from a very important word that was used in the New Testament in the language of the day. The international language of the day was Greek. It's called Koine Greek. And the root word, many of you have heard this word, is agape. And it is the, what we sometimes say, the God kind of love. And it really was a word that was rarely used in the larger society in Koine Greek, but that word has become world famous, agape love, because of the teachings of Jesus and then the apostles who used and expounded upon Jesus' teaching. It really is because of the New Testament that world, that word has become world famous, agape love. And I want to give you real quickly a snapshot of what agape love is, that Greek word. Agape is the primary love of the New Testament. It is not at the expense of the other kinds of love, human love, so um, family love, even romantic love, but it is the highest love. It is the highest form of love, listen to this, expressed as devotion, affection, and sacrificial self-giving to another. Let me say that one more time. It's the highest form of love expressed as devotion, affection, and sacrificial self-giving to another. It's a God kind of love. It's the one we're going to be talking about this morning. We know from this passage, one of the things we can say about love is that love is from God. Ultimately, love and the blessing and the gift that love is in all of its forms is something we know comes from God. Love is not just a mysterious power that is out there in the universe waiting for people to tap into as though the universe itself has some kind of mind as you will often hear in New Age religions and Hollywood spirituality as if the universe thinks for itself and love is just out there. No, the Bible teaches that love comes from God and even more so what John said in this passage is that God is 
love. It's a part of his nature and character. We know in God's nature and character that he is holy and he is also love. He is the source of love. Love is from God and God is love. Let's look at the um, next part of this passage, verse 9 in 1 John 4. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And as our lead pastor, Greg, shared during our communion time, that greatest expression of love that Jesus came and died so that we could be forgiven of sins. He rose from the dead and he won the victory over death so that we could have eternal life. The Bible says God showed how much he loved us through doing that for us. And we know that love is not just a mysterious and multi-dimensional thing. Love is not just a selfless thing. From the Bible, we know that love is a person. His name is Jesus. And his love is the greatest love there has ever been. And he came not only to give that love to you and me and to the world, but to demonstrate what it's like to live out of that love in the way that we relate to other people. Love is a person. The last verse, last two verses in that passage, verses 11 to 12. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. This is the special power of God's love. It comes from God into our souls as a believer in Jesus Christ and begins to change and transform us to where now we are able to give genuine love back to God and express genuine love in our relationships with other people. This is the spe- what I call the special power of the love of God. And what God wants for you and me is that we would be so filled, our lives would be full to the brim and running over in the love of God that our lives would be so dominated by his love and our understanding of the world and who we are and who God is that our experience of his love would change the way that we look at each other and the way that we relate to one another. And we really can live a life of love where we're giving that away. We're giving love back to God and we are giving that away to other people. That's the kind of love that we're talking about this morning. That's so good. Yeah, love is the most outstanding mark of the Christian life. And it's when that inner life begins to overflow into the way that we live is truly a pleasing fragrance on the earth. It's it's the fragrance of Christ on the earth. Now, I'm just curious in the room here, how many people have an association in any way with Elam Bible Institute in college? Meaning you've been a student, staff member, alumni. I see some hands, it's a little bit dark with the the lights, but I think there's a good group of people here. Um, Well, I had the privilege of working there for eight years, and over those years, I, I had many different roles, I did many different things, and two of those roles were of a campus life director and an assistant dean. And for those of you who have been on the campus, you're familiar, but there's a building called the TAB, and there's a lot of things that happen in that building. Um, <laughs> it's the place where, you know, it's the place where um, you know, students gather, there's all kinds of services, chapels. They just got done with a week of prayer, which is an incredibly amazing time for students. They have talent shows, I mean, they have all kinds of things uh, in, that, in that building. But when I think of that building, I think of two very different smells, okay? Two smells in that building. And so the building, like I said, it's a place where people gather for spiritual refreshment. But then at the bottom of the building is actually a dormitory, and there's about 50 men that live down there, or can live in that that area, and apparently it's a really fun place to live. 
I've, I've heard a lot of good stories and a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> but my role as campus life director, in my role as campus life director, um, one of the things that I used to do is organize banquets. And I would organize once a year a ladies' banquet and an alumni banquet. And one of the things I would do in those banquets, or for those banquets, is I would go to Wegmans and I would buy a whole bunch of fresh flowers. I would fill the tables with beautiful flowers. If any of you have ever bought flowers from Wegmans, they're just amazing. And so I would set up the, the, the room, and when I would walk in in the morning, it was just like this waft of beautiful fragrance would just hit me, and it would just completely transform this room. I mean, it was just amazing. So that was my campus life role, with my association uh, with the, the top part of the tab. <laughs> now, in my assistant dean role, one of my jobs was to do room inspections. And so I was kind of like mom. Uh, twice, once every other week, I would go down there and I would check the guys' dorms, make sure they were, they'd done their laundry, they'd made their bed, you know, they'd done all these kinds of things. And, and usually the guys were pretty self-aware and they wanted to make a good impression, they wanted to pass inspections. And so they would, their rooms were nice, they even had diffusers going, so it was like a nice smell, you know, when you came in. But every once in a while, every once in a while, there was a student or two who would forget about room inspections. And when I would step into some of those rooms, I mean, it was just so incredibly horrid. Like, I can't even, like, explain to you. Like, it was so bad, I would ask myself the question, like, did something die in here? Like, like is there an animal under the bed? Like, it was just so incredibly horrible. But of those two memories, the one I like to remember the most is the one of the banquets, right? The one of the beautiful fragrance that would come from those fresh Wegmans flowers. You know, the fragrance of fresh flowers is what makes weddings memorable, right? Anniversaries, even funerals can be less harsh and sad with fresh flowers. Well, I'm gonna read to you a very tender communication that Jesus had with his disciples. This was shortly before his crucifixion that speaks of another kind of beautiful fragrance. It's from John 13. My children, I will be with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. But a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So when, we, when I read this passage, I asked the question, you know, what does this mean? How can flawed humans like you and me that make mistakes all the time love like Jesus loved? How can we do that? Well, I think we need to begin to ask ourselves the question, how did Jesus love? Let's look at our example. How did he love his disciples? What was he showing them through the way that he, he interacted with them and the way that he lived? Well, one of the ways is seen in just a few moments before he spoke these words, and this is earlier in chapter 13. It says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave the world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simeon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. Now, obviously, this isn't a practice that we relate to today, but people back then would walk around in sandals on very dirty roads, and typically when they would enter a home, it was usually someone very lowly, the lowliest servant of the home would come and wash the guests' feet before they were to come in. But this time it was Jesus who did this humbling task. You know, I can imagine as the disciples are watching him, they're thinking, this was the one who healed the sick. 
This is the one that raised Lazarus from the dead. This is the one who spoke with authority, the one who calmed the storm. How could he, of all people, be the one to do this for us? But you see, that was the point. That was the pleasing fragrance on the earth. You know, when I think of that kind of love, I think of my mom and dad. I, I didn't come from a family of great preachers or missionaries, but my mom and dad were superstar servants and served our family in so many different ways. When we were young, younger, <laughs> young with four small children, um, no, I guess we're not young anymore. I can't say we're young. We were, we were young. <laughs> um, very overwhelming, right? Have four small kids, all under the age of six. My mom and dad would come all the time, and they, they, would, they would ask me, like, what do you need? You know, I want, you know, they'd come and they'd clean my house. They'd watch my kids so we could go out on a date. They'd store our freezer with homemade casseroles so that we could just have, you know, nothing to worry about. They'd help Nathan with projects around the house. They, whatever they could do to lift a burden, they would. And they did this not just with their family. They still do it with their family, and they also do it with their community where they live. <clears throat> but this was the example that Jesus was showing them, to live in service of others, even difficult people. You know, we have to remember that in that story, Judas was among the disciples whom Jesus washed his feet, right? A difficult person, a person he knew was going to betray him, but yet he, he, he did this act. He did this act of service because, you see, love is an action because when we love like Jesus, loving like Jesus means lowering myself to serve and elevate others. You know, I want to just ask you for a moment to think about the most difficult person in your life right now. Could be someone from work, could be a supervisor, a coworker, could be your spouse, it could be a friend, it could be a sibling. And I want to challenge you to think about this question, to ask, Lord, what can I do for that person this week? What is a way that I can practice this example that you showed me in Scripture of serving, of humbling myself, that my mind would be about lifting them up in some way? It's a really challenging prayer to pray. But it's one of those prayers, you know, it's kind of like the prayer to, to share Christ with someone. I don't know about you, but whenever I pray that prayer, I feel like I always have an opportunity to do that <laughs> because there's some things that I think just are so on the heart of God that he just makes it happen, you know? And uh, it's the same way with this. If we, if we pray prayers like this, he's so wanting us to do these kinds of things. Well, later in the chapter, we see Jesus love the disciples in another way. So he begins to talk with them about his departure that he would be leaving and that they wouldn't be able to follow him. And Peter, who, as we who have studied the scripture, have come to understand is a very impetuous, um, excitable at times, says, puts his foot in his mouth, you know, at, at different occasions. He jumps up. I can, just, I can just see him, you know, and he says, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. He makes this statement. And, you know, it's in that moment where Jesus stops him. And, and I don't think it was a harsh moment. I don't think it was like a, you know, this is what's going to happen. I think it was a loving moment that he wanted him to know that he had weakness in his life. And he told him, he said, actually, the opposite's going to happen. Actually, you're going to deny me three times. And this this example that Jesus is showing us, he's, he's, he's showing us someone who is really going to fail in a, in, a, in a big way, right? A really, really big way. Like, he, he literally just left the earth, and he's already denying him. But Jesus was showing us and showing him that, that he had a big plan for his life, and that failure, that wasn't going to define him. That was just a part of his story, and that was actually going to help him to see that he couldn't do it by himself, that he needed God's power working in him to do the thing that, that God had called him to do. Well, we see in Paul's letter to the Colossian church another, another place where, where we see this God love 
that he's, 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 he's leading us into. With, and this is with fellow believers in the church. In Colossians 3, it reads, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive one, anyone who offends you. Remember that the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. You see, love is an action. And loving like Jesus means forgiving when I am wrong. You see, we always forget this, but people are not our enemies. <laughs> They're not. And, you know, sometimes we, it's very easy for us to say, well, I forgive them, but I really don't want to, I just kind of want to keep them over here, right? I don't, I'm really hoping I don't bump into them in Wegmans or Aldi or, you know, because I really don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation with them. But, but I forgive them, you know, but, but I, but I kind of want to just sort of keep my distance. You know, a really dear friend and mentor of, of mine named Sylvia Evans recently reminded me of a truth that has really resonated in my heart when I think about God and relationships. And he said, and she said, reconciliation is always God's heart. I want you to think about that statement for a second. Reconciliation is always God's heart. I believe that he doesn't want us to be quite so satisfied with this inner letting go of an offense, that there are, are actions that we are to take. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about things where there's abuse or anything that's harming you, and obviously there are times where we need separation for healing for a time, but that God is always calling us to, to move toward reconciliation. To, to make a call, to, to try to set up a coffee date, to apologize, to try to have a dinner with them, to, to let that offense fully get out of us, right? To fully be released in our life. Because we often deceive ourselves that we've forgiven, but we really haven't. And, and what it does is it, it steals our unity. It steals our joy, right? There's a joy that comes when we are in community. I mean, just, you know, we've been in this prayer thing, prayer together, right? There's, there's a, a wonderful joy that happens when we gather. And, and this is God's heart for us. And, and, you know, as I'm saying these words to you, you might be thinking, well, they just keep doing it. They keep doing that wrong over and over and over and over again. And, you know, when I, when I think about that question and when I've even said it myself, right, with individuals in my life, I think about that time Jesus was confronted with that question. Now, I know we've got some, lots of Bible scholars in this room, but how many times did, did Jesus say that we should forgive a person who's been doing it over and over and over and over again? Seventy times seven. Now, does that mean at 490 we, have to, we don't have to forgive anymore? Is that what that means, right? And in our life, God will stop forgiving us if we've sinned 40, you know, 491 times, right? That's not what it means. It means that, that his love and his grace is just so big that there's no number on it, right? It doesn't matter how many times they've done it. Or you might be thinking, you know what? You don't really understand, Emily, the pain that I have endured because of those wrongs. And you know, to answer that question, you're right. I don't, but he does. He understands. He knows what you need, and the reality is that it's through the forgiveness that you're going to be healed, that they're kind of, they're interconnected. They're not separate. It's not at the expense of healing. It actually causes healing in our life. Now, I'm going to invite you to make a faith statement with me to, to really remind ourselves of the God perspective of relationships. You know, we very often think about things from human perspectives, and, and we forget the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives through, through difficult interactions. You know, there's things that won't be accomplished in us unless we walk through certain things. And if we really want to learn to love like Jesus loved, 
I just want to invite you to speak this truth with me. And it'll be up on the screen here in a moment. And if not, I could just say it to you. Okay, I'll just, how about I say it and you repeat it after me? Oh, there it is, okay. I will allow the people in my life to fail in big ways because Jesus gives me big forgiveness. I've forgiven them even ahead of their mistakes. I will commit to walk out forgiveness to its fullest measure for the rest of my life. Now that's a commitment. I remember a mentor or friend of the Elam community once said that lordship is signing the check before we know what's written on it. Anybody ever heard that? I sign the check even though I don't know what it's going to cost me. <laughs> or forgiveness is a lot like that. And as we love like Jesus loved, we live to do these two things. We serve in humility. We live in an orientation of how can the people in my life be lifted higher than even me? What can I do to serve in my community? And we forgive and we walk out forgiveness in a very tangible, actionable way. When we do these things, you and I, we become the fragrance of Christ on the earth. Isn't that amazing? God wants his love to be so big in our lives. The primary mark of our lives that the world looks at us and sees love. And to do that, we need to fill up and orient our life in God around his love. We need to rethink and get to God's truth about some of the things we believed about ourselves and who God is and land and live on the truth that the love of God for us in Christ Jesus will never end. And he loves us as we are and as we grow in Christ. God loves, we all know it's true. God loves everybody, right? How many of you know that's true? He loves everybody. He loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. His love is so big. And he will never stop loving you. And he looks at you today, and he looks at you right now with eyes of love and a heart of love. That is the God we serve and worship. And he wants that love to be so defining of your life. The more and more you grow in it, the more you will become defined by it. That your view of him, you believe he is a holy God, but he loves you through and through. And that that love would then begin to change the way that you relate to others. And two of those primary marks of a life of love are serving and elevating others and forgiving people when we've been wrong. And the things that Emily was sharing, I, I could just feel the, the sensitivity and um, thinking of different people in my life and different parts of our stories. And there are surely people, and some of you have people in your mind right now, both that God would call you to serve and to elevate, like Jesus did in washing his disciples' feet, putting himself in the lower position, that they would be elevated in some way to show them how much he loves them. John 13 said that he loved them while he was with them, and then he loved them to the end, loved them to the uttermost when he went and did that for them. And surely there are some people in some of your minds, I believe, that the way the Holy Spirit works when his word is being talked about and his people are gathered together, that God would have you to lovingly serve and elevate. And there are those who have wronged you, 
Maybe it has been on your perception. Maybe it is obviously known as a wrong. And whether they admit it or not or are even aware of it, the Lord would call us to walk out that path of forgiveness and he'll give us strength and he'll give us help. His love will help begin healing over the wounds in our own lives from the wrongs that we've suffered. And he would call us to commit before him to forgiveness and our three challenges today for loving people as we finish out this series devoted have to do with these things to give you practical ways as the lord is pinpointing things in your life these are not like um laws that you have to follow to succeed before god um or something that you have to say i'm going to do all three of these in order to receive and be the kind of person that Nathan and Emily are talking about from God's Word today. These are challenges we want to offer you as opportunities, as the Lord would lead you and call you to it, to take a step, maybe to take a step out of that world of relationship you have with a certain individual, or maybe it's a family or something, or someone at work, to take a step out of the world of difficulty you've experienced and to begin to take action in the love of God. Are you ready for our week five challenges? Three levels of loving people. Level number one, send a note, make a call, or visit someone your heart has been moved by God's love for, but you've yet to do anything about. You've been carrying, you've just been sensing this love of God for the person, and you haven't expressed that to them. And unless there is some reason to believe that it is very not appropriate for you to take action to show this person God's love, I want to challenge you to do something like this, one of these things. Level two, commit to doing something to begin breaking down walls you have constructed towards someone you're holding something against. It just got a lot harder with level two, didn't it? That's kind of the idea um, here. Write down, to, because of how difficult this is, uh, is to do so often, I want to challenge you to write down, maybe even right now in your phone, or to text yourself, or send a message to yourself, or write it down, what you are going to do to t even if it's a small step to begin dismantling the wall you have constructed to block out someone, something you're holding against them. Level number three, our last one. Elevate someone this week with whom you found relationship difficult. And here's the practical idea. Words or actions that encourage and build confidence. In that person who can you speak to in an encouraging way and build confidence to elevate them even if there's something in your humanity and very often there is in our humanity with certain kinds of people and certain relationship dynamics that says I really don't want to do this and the reason is and then you can fill in the blanks our humanity will say, don't do that. You really shouldn't do that. It's not going to be good for you. They might use that against you, or they might hold that over you or lord it over you. And yet the Lord set an example for us of elevating others by serving them in humble ways. So what can you do with words or actions to do that in another person's life? Would you stand with me as we, stand with us um, as we finish up today? I want to ask if our ministry team serving today, if you could come into the front area here to be available to people. As we, um, as we finish the service and as people are heading out, this morning there's been some really sensitive things that have been talked about. And if you're carrying some of this stuff in a big way and it's been really difficult to you for you, we want to invite you to not leave here without receiving the prayer support of another person. You know, today's a great opportunity to go right out of this service and head into another prayer and spirit-filled environment just in the youth room next door. Maybe you don't sense the need to be with our ministry team this morning. Maybe there's just something that's come up, and you can head in there for a few minutes or for a few whiles, a few hours, 
and just spend time in God's presence and just bring it to the Lord in a fresh way. What a great opportunity with our 23 hours of prayer this morning. As our lead pastor, Greg, was talking about having a relationship with Jesus this morning during our communion, if you have questions about what it means to be saved, to be born again and start a new life with God and be right with God and follow Jesus, I want to invite you to come to our ministry team in the front here after the service. They would be glad to talk with you and answer questions and pray for you. Maybe you have something else going on in your life. They want to pray with you today, and we want to pray for you this morning as we release the service. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, for your never-ending great love for us. There's nothing else like it in the world. Jesus, you will always be the best thing that is happening in our lives. There will never be anything better than you, Lord. Nobody else is like you. And nothing else will do for us what you do because of your love and your presence. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here this morning. Just sensing your presence all through the service, before the service, walking around in this building, Lord. Thank you for being here and ministering in the way that only you can. I pray today, God, we pray into that area of our hearts where there's been hurt and unforgiveness, Lord, and wounds. You are the healer of the inner parts of our lives. And so, God, we pray into that, that you would minister your healing this morning, that you would bring us and strengthen us to bring us to places of walking out forgiveness and loving them, even if it needs to start with loving them before you in prayer and expressing it to you. Lord, as you are calling us to serve, would you help us to Grab the opportunities we have and not let them go. Some of those opportunities are going to come to us and they will then be gone and we'll never get them back again. Lord, would you open up our eyes to see opportunities to serve others, to elevate people in our lives and just trust that you, Lord, will be the one who stands behind us and strengthens us and gives us courage and boldness to do it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. And I speak blessing over your people today. God, I bless them in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above all other names. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you as you go today, church.